Hello everyone, and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today, we're discussing three more recently solved cold cases. But first, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by BetterHelp. More on that in a minute, but with that being said, let's get into it. Number 3. Sarah Yarbrough on an early Saturday morning around 9.40 a.m. on December 14, 1991 in Seattle, Washington, two boys grabbed their skateboards and cut through a grassy field to head to their favorite grocery store parking lot. The walk from their homes nearby was meant to be short. They were chatting as they walked, carrying their boards under their arms. Then, all of a sudden, a man popped out of the tall grass, startling the boys. The two stared at the man, who stared right back at them and all was still for a moment. Then the man started walking off. Initially, the boys brushed it off and thought that the man had been smoking weed or something in the bushes. They thought the encounter was strange, but kind of rationalized it. However, one of the boys glanced down at the area that the man had popped up from and noticed the body of a young girl. Her mouth and eyes were open and she lay so still, too still. The two of them bolted, which caught the attention of the man. They ran back to their homes and got their parents, who went back to the field with them, hoping it wasn't too late, but by the time the kid's father reached the girl, she was already gone. For the reason, he just walked out of the bush and started walking the same direction we were, so we kept kept walking and looked at each other like, what the hell is that dude doing? Probably just, we had both assumed he's probably just smoking some weed in the bushes. So we kept on walking because we couldn't see where Sarah was yet until we got closer. And I continued watching the guy who stood up because I was uneasy about this dude that time in the morning just sitting in the bush, especially after we had just wasted so much time smashing all those puddles. And then all of a sudden Adam said, there's a girl in the bushes. And I turned and looked and that's when I saw Sarah's body. Turned back, looked at him. He was now standing close. There was a vehicle parked right around the corner where the parking lot is, standing right next to that vehicle, <clears throat> grabbed Adam and said, run, ran back to my house. The girl was identified as 16-year-old Sarah Yarbrough. She had left home early that morning for a drill team competition. She was in her uniform. Her pantyhose had been used as a ligature around her neck. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation, and she had fought like hell. She had scratched her attacker over and over and had drawn blood. DNA from under her fingernails was collected and preserved, along with DNA found on her clothing. Her car was found nearby at the Federal High School, and it is believed that she had been abducted in the parking lot and led to the field where she was murdered. Sarah was a sweet and kind girl. She was smart, artistic, and a born leader. She was the captain of her drill team. She was caring and had gone out so early that morning to help organize and get her teammates prepared for the competition that morning. Her siblings had still been in bed when police officers delivered the heartbreaking news to their parents. The boys that had discovered her body gave a detailed description to police sketch officers. They said the man had blonde hair cut into a mullet big blue eyes, and appeared to have acne or scars along his jaw and was clean-shaven. The DNA had been uploaded to state and national databases, but nothing came up. A plea went out to the community, along with the sketch, to be on the lookout for someone matching the sketch that may be acting differently or have scratches on them. If you know the man who killed at Federal Way High School, then police say you will have recognized the odd changes in his behavior. If so, they need to hear from you. However, the suspect was never found and Sarah's murder case eventually went cold, but her murder haunted the community and the two boys who had found her. In 2019, the King County Sheriff's Office reopened the case. Because they had such strong DNA evidence, they opted to use genetic genealogy to find a potential suspect. However, they didn't need to do that when a state database pulled up a familial match from a brother whose DNA was in federal databases for a criminal conviction. The felon's brother became the prime suspect, 59-year-old Patrick Leon Nicholas. Law enforcement discovered Nicholas had a previous conviction in 1983 for the abduction and sexual assault of Anne Crony. She recalled the event in an interview to the media, quote, 
He reached through the open driver's window and pulled a knife to my throat and told me to take my clothes off. And I ran as fast as I could and dove into the river and I swam harder than I ever swam before until I couldn't anymore. He had been sentenced to 10 years for the crime, but had been released after three. Had he served his full sentence, he never could have murdered Sarah Yarborough. Detectives surveilled Nicholas and found him in a Kent County bar. They watched him for a while and picked up a discarded cigarette butt and a napkin. They collected the items and tested them for DNA, which ultimately matched the DNA of Sarah Yarbrough's killer. They arrested Nicholas once that match came in. In May 2023, he went to trial on charges of first and second degree murder. During the trial, Nicholas's legal team tried to argue the validity of the DNA evidence, as well as throw out the sketch and witness testimony of the two boys, now men in their 40s. Nicholas was 27 at the time of the murder and on probation for his previous conviction. The jury deliberated and came back with a guilty verdict. Patrick Leon Nicholas was sentenced to 45 years in prison for the murder of Sarah Yarborough effectively a life sentence. Law enforcement are now looking into other cold cases to see if Nicholas has any additional victims. We, the jury, find the defendant Patrick Leon Nicholas guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. An emotional day in the courtroom as dozens of family members and friends of Sarah Yarborough speak out while facing her convicted killer. Earlier this month, the jury found Patrick Leon Nicholas guilty of murder. He was also found guilty of committing the crimes with sexual motivation. Yarborough's body was found behind her high school in Federal Way back in December of 1991. This morning, her mother asked the judge for the highest sentence possible. He should never have the chance to harm another vulnerable woman. He's had 28 years of freedom that Sarah never got. A judge sentenced Nicholas to just over 45 years in prison. Now, I'd like to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an app that matches you to therapist professionals anywhere, anytime. I used this service long before they were a sponsor for the convenience of being able to do therapy from home, and it helped me to work through some traumatic events. My experience has been good, and I was able to connect with a therapist, and I worked with them for a long while. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service, and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether that's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. Having that flexibility is awesome and it works with you with what you're most comfortable with. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you can get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you with more scheduling flexibility and at a more affordable price. Check out my link, betterhelp.com slash TCM, and use my code TCM to get 10% off your first month and get started today. That is betterhelp slash TCM to get 10% off. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. Number 2. Joseph Demare. It was on March 24, 1961, when Miami PD was called to the scene of what was believed to be a carjacking. The alleged victim who called, 33-year-old Frances Damare, claimed that while she and her husband, 53-year-old Joseph Damare, were on their way to dinner, two men jumped into their vehicle and while they were at a red light and forced them to drive to an empty lot nearby. She claimed that the men had guns and had pistol whipped her and she was knocked unconscious. When she came to, she saw that her husband had been killed in the driver's seat. She claimed that when she realized her husband was dead, she ran barefoot to the nearest gas station to call the police. When law enforcement arrived, they found the vehicle with Joseph inside, shot once in the temple. Frances hadn't been hurt in the attack. In fact, she was completely clean despite being in close quarters with someone who was shot. She had been found barefoot but with no scrapes or cuts on the bottom of her feet, which was unusual for someone claiming to have sprinted barefoot on concrete, gravel, and dirt. 
her sneakers were found neatly placed next to the vehicle. Detectives went to the Damare home, where there was evidence that supported an alternative theory. However, it doesn't appear that this theory was ultimately investigated. Francis and Joseph had been having marital issues, so much so, in fact, that Francis had moved out of the home. It was Joseph's second marriage. His first wife had died of cancer five years before, leaving him to raise his four children alone. Joseph was a millionaire, having founded a successful produce distribution company. Francis didn't get along with Joseph's children, and there had been over a 20-year age difference between the two. And after a few years of marriage, it was clear that it wasn't going well. Joseph had suspicions that his new wife wanted him killed, and had changed his will to remove her as a benefactor from his estate in the event of his death. Francis had been notified of the change and returned home in the days before the murder. After the murder, Francis kicked out Joseph's children that were still living at home, 17-year-old Richard and his younger sister, who was only nine at the time, allegedly only giving them 24 hours to pack and move out. Francis did get some of Joseph's estate, about $250,000, despite being the lead suspect in her husband's murder and it's unclear why the case went cold, when there was a staggering amount of evidence that Francis had been lying about what had happened that night. The murder had ultimately been blamed on mobsters, and the investigation against Francis was impeded by government officials who didn't want her investigated, and the case sat unsolved for six decades. In 2021, the case was reopened, and it was then when glaring issues with the original investigation came to light. Crime scene photos showed that Joseph was in the passenger seat, not the driver's, when he'd been killed. There had also been evidence that detectives had gone to his home, and in the garage they found blood evidence in a spray pattern, determining that was where he'd been killed and then driven to the empty lot. The gun evidence also revealed that the weapon used had likely been Joseph's own pistol that he'd gifted to Francis for protection. Shell casings found in the vehicle matched shell casings found in the home near a makeshift target practice area on the property. Also in the case files were witness statements from those close to the couple. Multiple accounts claim that Joseph was in the process of filing for divorce from Francis because he discovered that Francis had been trying to hire a hitman to murder him. He'd been trying to expedite the process hours before he was murdered. With all this evidence, it was unclear why this case was never solved. The evidence appeared to point directly to Francis. The working theory based on the evidence found was that she'd been notified either legally or been made aware that Joseph was filing for divorce and went back to Miami, convinced Joseph to get into the passenger seat and then shot him at their home. Then she waited until it was dark, drove his body out to the vacant lot, and manufactured a carjacking story. Frances was never arrested or charged with the murder of her husband, and she died in 2006. He had already changed his will to say that she would only receive her share if she was living with him as his wife at the time of his death. So she had left and gone back to Ohio. She found out about this will change, so she came back to the Keystone house, and it was at that time he told her that he was going to get a divorce, and if she was divorced, she wouldn't get a share of any estate. Of Joseph's children, Richard Damare is the sole survivor, and when he was notified that his stepmother had been found to be responsible for his father's death, he expressed his gratitude to the volunteer private cold case investigator, Paul Novak, that worked diligently to solve the case, as well as Miami PD, for making the announcement and closing his father's murder investigation. Novak blamed government corruption, undue influence, and intentional derailment for the delay in justice that ultimately led to Francis living her life consequence free. And it is a crime that could have and should have been solved a long time ago, perhaps even the night of the murder. Number 1. Kathleen Krausenick it was on February 19, 1982, in Brighton, New York, when 30-year-old Jim Krausenack returned home from work. The house was quiet, and he couldn't find his wife and three-year-old daughter. 
He went upstairs, and it was then that he discovered the body of his wife, 29-year-old Kathy, in their bed, covered in blood, with an axe embedded in her body still. He then went to his daughter's bedroom, where he found her alone and unharmed. He picked her up and ran to the neighbor's house to call the police. Detectives arrived and confirmed that Kathy was deceased. She'd been hit once to the back of the head with the axe. She was still in her nightgown, and it appeared that she'd been sleeping when she'd been attacked. Her husband had claimed that he had left for work early that morning, and when he left, everyone in the home was still sleeping. An initial glance at the crime scene appeared to have been a robbery gone bad. There had been valuables strewn about the home, but according to Jim, nothing seemed to be missing. The items also appeared to be a little too perfect. There were plastic bags around some of the items, like this tea set that was found in the middle of the living room, with items appearing to be hastily gathered but ultimately abandoned. Kathy's wallet and purse had been dumped out on the floor, but nothing was missing, and jewelry was still out in the open. Kathy had no defensive wounds, and she hadn't been sexually assaulted, which also confused detectives. What had been the motive? Kathy was known as a bright and friendly person, she had a wide group of friends, and she was well-loved. No one knew of anyone who would have wanted Kathy to be hurt. Jim Krausenack became the lead suspect, however there was no direct evidence at the time to connect him to the crime, and he wasn't arrested at that time. The case would eventually go cold. In 2015, the case was reopened. After Kathy's murder, Jim had moved from Brighton, and for 40 years he lived in peace. He had remarried three times, and his daughter, now in her mid-forties, remained at his side. She had always believed her father had been innocent of her mother's murder. The evidence of the case was re-examined, and although there weren't any smoking guns directly tying Jim to the murder, there were multiple little things that had started to add up. A bloody footprint was found in the garage, which matched a pair of boating shoes Jim had in his closet. It had been a freezing winter day the night of the murder, and it didn't make sense for a murderer to come in, change into boating shoes, or Jim's boating shoes, nor for the murderer to have been wearing the boating shoes to begin with. It was too cold. Then there was the staging of the robbery, the lack of motive, the lack of items stolen. It was all very suspicious. Then the murder weapon had been an axe taken from the garage, but a second axe had been used to break a window that had made it look like the murderer had come in that way. Why would someone break in, grab an item from the home, to make it appear that they'd come in through a window if they were already inside? Breaking a window makes noise. Why take the risk? They also examined Jim's timeline of the day, and it wasn't matching Kathy's time of death, which would have placed Jim inside the home when she'd been killed. They also uncovered a key piece of evidence that they believe might have been the catalyst for the murder. Jim had lied on his resume, having claimed to have finished his doctoral requirements, but he hadn't. It may have been something the couple had fought about. Also, it was what wasn't found. There was no other DNA found in the home besides those who lived there. No fingerprints, blood, sweat, or touch transfer. Nothing on any of the items that had been moved or on the murder weapon. Nothing that pointed to an alternative suspect. In 2019, an arrest warrant for Jim Krausenack was signed and he was arrested and held while he waited trial. At the time of his arrest, he was 68 years old. He maintained his innocence and the trial went forward after several delays in 2022. Kathy's father, now 95, was able to attend the trial along with Kathy's sister both having spent the better part of four decades advocating for Kathy's case to be solved. On September 19th, 2022, after weeks of trial, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. On November 7th, 2022, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison, but in May 2023, he died at the age of 71 years old. His lawyers had already filed an appeal, and because he died before the appeal could be heard, his conviction may be vacated. of hearing the verdict. We did it. We did it. 
justice for Kathy. Just on the fact that, you know, we knew Kathy was killed in, in the early morning hours when she was sleeping. Um, and, and when you take into account everything that comes with that, it, there was no one else that could have done this, done this crime. Despite this, Kathy's family feel that justice has been served. Kathy's sister Annette made this statement to the media, quote, Even though Jim did not serve his full sentence, we believe that karma was done when he died an undignified death behind prison walls. The entire world knows that he killed my sister, and he died knowing that. Well, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Other ways to support the channel by joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch and you will find all the links in the description box plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more. But with that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It is very much appreciated. That's it for me. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.